Hi guys, welcome to my first uh, draft video. Uh, in this particular video, uh, I'm going to look at the question that Alex asked, which was uh, how to stop third and fifth ball attacks. Um, I've got a few props here that will help me along the way, uh, and of course some notes. Um, so, uh, as I said, bear with me, it's, it's an uh, initial draft version. Um, what you're seeing at the moment is just really my living room at home. Uh, because it's convenient and my main centre is closed, uh, in the future I'd be doing it at a proper um, centre. Uh, so the background would be obviously a lot nicer. Anyway, let's get into the actual information. So, talking about how to stop third and fifth ball attacks. Uh, there's several points I want to make along um, these lines. Pretty much boiling down to, uh, firstly, uh, why would you want to why would you want to avoid third and fifth ball attacks? Okay, why is it important to do so? Uh, secondly, what does your opponent want to do when he's third ball and fifth ball and attacking? Uh, thirdly, what do you want to do to stop him? What's your goals? Uh, fourth, I'll look at the actual breakdown of what constitutes a third ball attack and what goes into making up a fifth ball attack uh, to understand the structure behind it. Uh, then, going from there, have a look at actually uh, some things on how to get into actually stopping the third ball attack itself um, and talk a little bit about what methods you can use um, to prevent your opponent making good third and fifth ball attacks. Okay, so let's uh, kick things off and firstly let's have a look at um, why would you want to avoid a third or a fifth ball attack. Okay. Now, if you're uh, firstly an aggressive type of player using um, your long pips or your anti-spin um, and you're looking to aggressively set up put away opportunities yourself where well, you want to avoid a third or a fifth ball or attack from your opponent because you want to be doing the attacking yourself. You want to be setting up kill opportunities um, more often. So that would be one good reason to avoid them. Uh, secondly, is if you're a very uh, conservative defensive player who prefers to play a very pushing tight game, um, preventing your opponent getting in at all as much as possible, that would be another good reason to uh, basically tie the game up and keep your opponent confined and unable to break out with any attacking. That would be another good reason to avoid third ball or fifth ball attacks. Uh, one thing you might want to consider though as well is that for a lot of players it's not necessarily that you want to avoid a third or a fifth ball attack as such, it's that you want to avoid a powerful and effective third ball or fifth ball attack. Okay? So from this point of view what we'd be saying is okay, let your opponent make those attacks but make, let him make them in such a way that you're well prepared and you can capitalise on the fact that he's not making it with full power and force and it gives you something to work off. Okay? So in those sort of cases what we're looking at is not so much to avoid a third or fifth ball attack, but to avoid, avoid a good third or fifth ball attack. Okay. If you, are one of these, if you are one of these players who prefers to uh, allow your opponent to attack but not well, you then have to be a little bit more careful about what you're doing with your return to serve and how you're building the point. Because then if you return too tightly and your opponent can't get in at all, you're going to then start getting into a pushing role. And that may not be what you want to encourage him to do. So if you're too loose and you actually um, return too easily, okay, he's going to blow the ball past you. So it's a little bit of a fine line to walk there uh, to encourage him to attack but keep him from attacking very well. Now obviously if an opponent can make strong attacks, um, that's not really good for you because you may not be able to handle, handle the speed or the spin or both. Uh, you may not be able to handle the placement. Um, he may be able to burn it past you here or wide or get you at your playing elbow. Or as a, a combination bat user, he may be able to target your inverted rubber, your normal rubber, a lot more than you want to let him when you're not prepared for it. And that can be a, a, a not a very good thing from a combination bat user, is that we want to control when our opponent gets a look at our inverted rubber. We want it to be under our circumstances when we dictate 
not when he just whenever he feels like going to that inverted side that he can he can get it, especially not with a strong attack. Okay, so really just summing up there on terms of why to avoid them. Uh, firstly, if we want to be aggressive, we want to do the attacking. If we want to play a very conservative, tight game and shut down your opponent, and if we do actually want to let him, we want to let him attack the fifth balls, but not well. Okay. So the next step to look at after that is basically to have a look at and think to yourself, okay, what, what does my opponent actually want to do with his third ball and his fifth ball attack? Besides winning the point, obviously. Okay. What is he looking for? So when, when your opponent's coming up here, he's got his, got his bat, and he's about to serve, what's in his head? You know, what's his plan? And typically, your opponent's going to look for certain things, and the, the key word here that I like to stress is uh, predictability. Okay? The more your opponent can make things predictable for him, the better off his chances of making a good third ball or a good fifth ball are. Okay? And by that I mean if he can force you to make a return with a predictable amount of spin and limit you to a float return or a spinny return, he can force the amount, that takes one factor out that he has to worry about, he knows what to expect. If he can make you return a certain type of spin, uh, a good example would be someone like Kip Tran, uh, serves with his left handed, serves a lot of top spin serves, looking for top spin returns. And what he's trying to do is force you to give him a, a weakish top spin return that he can stay close to the table count a loop. Okay? What he's doing is he's forcing the type of spin return. Uh, if he can force it to be put in a place where he doesn't actually have to move. So uh, force the locations so that instead of him having to get out of the way of the ball or chase the ball, if he can basically I'll go with, he can basically serve, recover and have the ball coming into his power zones, that's great for him. Again, one less thing he has to worry about. Doesn't have to move while he hits it. Uh, if he can I guess he's looking to have quick points that are under his control. What he's doing usually is he doesn't want a long rally because the longer the rally goes, the more chances you've got to influence and control and twiddle and basically mess with his timing and mess with his rhythm. And so the longer the rally goes, the better your chances are. What he's trying to do is get it bang, over, done before you've had a chance to work your way in to the point. So he's looking for short points. Uh, also typically because a lot of these guys don't want to have to play long games. So if they can serve and bang, it means that they stay fresher for the next one. They don't actually want to have to have a play a long, hard, five game, massively long match against a, a pusher or a blocker who's making them work and work and work for every point. Okay? So quick points. Uh, he's also hoping to make you use your anti-spin uh, in a predictable way. Uh, if he can make you use it so that if he's got a certain serve that he knows you will always have to do a certain return with your anti deck to hold it, to handle it, that's great for him. He can go to that serve and he'll know that, okay, this is all you do. So if he can force you to use your anti-spin in certain ways, again, one less thing of his equation. Typical example is the attacking player giving you that long, fast, no spin serve straight to the pips or straight to the ante. What's he looking for? Yep, he's looking for that floated return and hopefully maybe a little bit of a pop up that say 80% of long pip or anti spin players will give back. Okay? And if he can constantly work off that, well, he's got a safe point whenever there's a bit of pressure, he can go to that confident in the knowledge that what you're going to give him is something that's got no spin, nice and long, and right in his own. Okay? So if you're using your pips or your anti-spin predictably, that's great for him. Uh, he'd also be looking for a, a high or a mid-table return. What I mean by that is if he can get you to pop up the ball, that's great, makes his job easier attack. If he can get you to go into this mid-table area, uh,
what I mean by mid-table area is essentially, not necessarily exactly, but if you think of the yellow tower kind of representing, in most cases, a, a danger zone in terms of your return to serve. If your opponent can serve and get you to place the ball into this area, what he's doing is it's not deep enough to push him back, it's not short enough to make him come in and especially if you can't keep it low. If you pop up and short, he has all that angle. If you can go low and short, great. You, you can control him and stop him attacking. But anywhere in here is usually that area where the opponent can serve, stay here, and still swing cleanly without worrying about the table, and make contact over the table, angling down. Unless you can keep it really, really low. If you do keep it low, a ball that lands here is going to come off the end. 9 times out of 10, or probably even 99 times out of 100. If you land it here, it's going to come, he can make contact, wait, and make good contact from here. Whereas we want him to be coming back here, or moving. And of course, if you're in here, unless you can find his plane in your boat, chances are all he's going to have to do is basically go bang, and bang. If you get it there, he may have to move a little bit and do that. Okay. But this is a very dangerous area for your return of serve to go. If he can predictably make you go in there, that's, that's half his job done. Um, uh, yep, what else would he like? Uh, he'd also prefer to uh, restrict your options in terms of being able to counter-attack. Uh, if I'm a serving and attacking player playing somebody with long pitch or anti spin, I don't want to have to worry about somebody suddenly flicking or doing a fourth ball counter attack on me. What I want to do is be able to serve, put away the third ball, or spin up my third and get ready to kill the fifth. Having somebody suddenly come in and counter attack or it throws off my rhythm and makes me a little bit more hesitant about what's going on. So if I know my opponent, if I can control him and stop him from ever making a decent counter-attack, it takes one less pressure off me, I don't have to watch out for that. Okay? So if he can stop you getting in a decent counter-attack, again, it makes his job that much easier. And uh, yeah, probably the final thing that he'd like to do is be able to get at your smooth rubber, your inverted rubber, whenever he likes. Okay? Now some, I know some players will stand here and sort of chicken wing to do all this to get around it. It, it. It's an option, it's not a perfect option. Um, compared to being doing that versus a, a twiddle and that, in terms of positioning, uh, I would prefer the twiddle. Uh, but that way at least you're hiding the inverted when you don't want to control it, but you are giving up certain other options. Um, but the ability for yourself to choose when you want to use the inverted on the return of serve versus the pips is important. Um, if you're not able to do that, you're giving your opponent one more advantage. So if you're actually unable to chicken wing or unable to twiddle, then all he, he knows that if you stand like that, if he puts it there, he's got your inverted. Okay? Again, it's one more thing that he doesn't have to worry about. So in those sort of cases, a chicken wing return every now and again is a, is a better option than always going with the smooth and getting creamed. Okay? We have to be practical. It would be nicer to be able to hit it with the inverted or twiddle and go with the pips. If you haven't got the twiddle yet, chicken wing it and do something different, you know, just to break things up. Okay, so what we're doing is just trying to reduce predictability for the opponent. The more things he can make predictable, the easier his job is going to be to set up a third ball and a fifth ball. Okay. Alright, so what do you want to do? Well, you basically want to do the alt the opposite of what he's done, is you want to remove that confidence that he has to make the attack. Okay? And we do that by being more unpredictable, wherever possible, especially against opponents who are around our level, unpredictability is usually the way to go. Opponents who are weaker than you, you can get away with being predictable if they can't handle what you're doing. Uh, a good example is for someone like myself, I can play a, weaker, a much weaker player stand at the table, have them serve, and simply, whatever they do, turn my back to my smooth side, chop the hell out of the ball. And 
get them to hit it basically into the table or the bottom of the net. It's predictable, but they're not at a level to handle it. Obviously, if I'm trying to do that against someone like Hensel, I'm, not, I'm going to get creamed because he can firstly handle the chop, and secondly, if he knows that I'm doing that all the time, well, you know, I'm, I'm giving him points. Okay? But if we can be, if we can take away his confidence to bring on the power, and if we can force him to lift the ball, play safer, then we've got a good shot because we can then start working into the rally and doing what we want to do, which is control and dictate the points with our anti-spin long pips, with our twiggling, with our placement, and using, getting the maximum effects out of our rubber to, to basically control and dictate play. So a lot of it is being, is being a little bit unpredictable to prevent him from having that confidence to tee off. Um, in order to do that, well, okay, how can we do it? Pretty much what we're talking about with the opponent. We vary our spin placement, uh, a spin. We vary our placement. We vary which side we're using. We can vary where we stand, give them a look at something different. We vary the type of return so that although this may nine times out of ten be our best option, this sort of return here, sometimes you have to t do something different roll it, you know, shovel it across or flick it. Not because it's the better option each time, but because if you're always playing it the same way over the long term, it's a worse option. There has to be some variety in there. You can't play a predictable game um, and hope to play at a, at a higher level where players uh, know what they're doing against long pips. That's really the subject probably of another topic um, versus low level versus medium versus high level players, what works at different levels. But if, if you've got an eye of moving up the ranks, avoiding being predictable is, is something you do want to do. Um, being able to counter attack occasionally is important. Okay, Really what you do want to do here is you're, you're breaking down his confidence to hit with power and get it past you. And quite often what we're actually trying to do is give him not necessarily stop him attacking, but make him attack in a safe manner that works in with our style, that does what we want to do. Gives us the chance to handle it, put our pips or ante onto it, and start creating our own opportunities. And that's what we're trying, what we're trying to do. Okay, let's have a little bit of a look now at just a breakdown of how a third and a fifth ball attack works. And I'll start with the third ball. Um, makes sense to probably start with them. In your third ball, your opponent's there, he's serving. What he's looking for is he's looking for you, he's looking to force you to create a weak return that he can attack with winning power placement that will either basically end the point there and then. Now in order to do that, he really does have to use a good serve and he has to get that ball, that return, into a position where he can apply his power or and and or not just the power, but also be able to place it. Okay? Power itself isn't enough if he can only go in one direction. But if he can go two or three directions with power, okay, his job's done. And if he can do that consistently, then you're going to be in a lot of trouble. Okay? So uh, usually with these kind of third ball attacks, you're, you're usually looking at what he's going to need to do is he's going to need to get that ball either up so that he can get at, over the table at you and pick it up here, or you want it long, off, and I mean by long I mean basically off the end of the table, not bouncing here where he has to go back to handle it properly, but bouncing mid-table where it comes off the end and he can take a nice clean swing, and preferably in his power zones, whatever they may be. Now, in order to do that, what, he's going to, what most opponents are going to use are uh, generally a long serve. And the long serve is designed to be firstly hard for you to handle, very difficult for you to put short and stop him attacking, especially now that the frictionless pimples are gone, uh, it's even harder. So the long serve is designed for you to, get him, to get him the return he wants, which is a ball, preferably bouncing mid-table, coming off the end 
and nicely killable with power and, and placement. Uh, also, he'll quite often use a, a heavy spin to make it harder for you to control with any accuracy or to counterattack well. Mixed in with that, a lot of players will also use the shorter serve being either a top spin variant um, with the heavy top spin that they hope will get you to kick it up, or the sneakier players will use a side spin variant disguised as some form of backspin. Uh, very common is to have a, a, this pendulum serve where the ball is looking like chop and side and they're actually catching it just side. And if you play for the backspin and don't realise it's your side spin, you're going to pop it up high enough for him to kill. And that, that's also very common. That's easier for the player to do than just a simple short top spin serve. It's very hard to battle bounce that top spin serve. And it's also usually more obvious that it's a top spin serve. So the tricky side spin that looks like backspin side spin is often a favourite way to set up a third ball attack. Okay? Uh, the other one that's common against players who aren't all that used to their line of pips or their ante and haven't mastered basic techniques, the other common one is, is really just some form of float, um, whereas a, a beginner or intermediate will often quite tend to not use the right technique and tend to pop the float up. Okay, so, and we'll look at that in basic techniques as well. Okay, so that's, that's his third ball. If he can't get that third ball, if he can't get a tough return, a smart opponent is then going to spin heavy uh, or place his attack. Not necessarily blow it by you with power, but certainly attack it. Less strong, good placement, and try and use that to then set up your block and give himself an opportunity to fifth ball. Okay. Now where he puts that third ball, it will depend again on him, on you, um, but quite often he'll look for your inverted side because the block with the inverted comes up nicely for him to attack. Uh, he may occasionally go to the pips if he can catch you close, but then quite often that will depend, that depends on what he's like against a backspin ball. If he's good against a backspin ball, he may actually prefer to roll to your pips and look for the nice backspin that he can then kill off a higher backspin return. It depends on the player. And that comes back to um, scouting your opponents, which we'll talk about in a second. But generally what they're going to do is if they can't get the third ball, they're going to go to plan B and look for a fifth ball. Okay. Uh, if they're into a fifth ball and trying to do a fifth ball attack, they're either going to get there by uh, aborting the third ball, moving to a fifth ball, or they're going to get there by planning the fifth ball uh, from the start, where they're served, they're looking for their favourite setup opportunity, getting, getting the reply they want, and powering in their, their nice pattern that they like. If they've planned the fifth ball from the start, that's more dangerous um, because they'll be balanced and ready because they haven't done serve, look for the third ball, I can't get it, spin. What they will have done is serve tight, get my opening, spin it, back in position looking for my fifth ball pattern. They'll be better prepared. Okay? So you, you have to be, I guess, aware of that uh, to a certain extent. And that's a little bit about knowing what patterns your opponent prefers. Okay? Your job is obviously to not let him be comfortable enough to use either the third or the fifth. And we'll start talking firstly about now, getting to start, start getting into the idea of how we can stop this from happening. First thing that you should do in order to stop it from happening is, well, know your opponent. You should scout your opponent out. Now, if you're competing at a national championship, you may never have seen him before. Okay. Um, first time you see him, maybe when he walks on the court, that's pretty tough. Okay? There's not a lot you can do there. You're not going to pick up a lot about him in the two minute warm up. You can pick up a few clues, but you're not going to see the real nitty gritty in two minute warm up. So wherever possible, get a look at your opponent. Okay? And I'll talk more about scouting opponents later, but what we're looking for is you're looking for, in this case, you're looking for his favourite patterns. 
his favourite serves, follow loves. Um, where is he strong? Where is he weak? And this is the information that's going to influence what he's going to be doing to you and what you're going to do back. A uh, simple example, uh, I guess, of this would be uh, talking about some of the Australian players that I know. How you would, how you would, ex what you would expect from someone like William William Hensel is going to be completely different from what you'll get from someone like Kit um, Tran. Different again from someone like um, Alex Swanson, um, because although they're all good players, they have different strengths, different weaknesses, different patterns. So if you're going out to play William. Um, you should know he's got the big backhand, he's got the slightly more erratic forehand. So for someone like William, if I'm returning my returning the serve, if I'm returning the serve into this area and trying to maybe make him move on the backhand, I'm playing a fairly dangerous game. Because if I'm out by just a little bit, I'm right into his favourite power zone. No good. Um, whereas playing back to someone like Kit, who's a left-hander, short pips in the backhand, looking to fast tops and everything. Um, Kett's not going to play that ball here if I go slow. He's going to come around and topspin it, or try to topspin it. But that gives me other opportunities in placing balls down the line that I don't get against William, because William will stand there, play there, and play there. Kett will serve and be ready to come across here and tends to leave the gap down the forehand. Can you exploit it? Maybe not. <laughs> Depends on what level you are to try and take advantage of it. But you have to be aware of these sort of patterns. Where are they favourites? What do they like? William doesn't seem to matter really. You return top spin or you return chop, at least the level I return. He handles both. Kiet definitely favours, he prefers people top spinning, flicking semi-looping to him so that he can cream a counter loop. Um, not quite so strong against the heavy push return. He doesn't want to lift it. He wants to counter drop, counter loop or counter drive. So he's not gonna you're not gonna see a lot of chop serves against Kip. Okay? I need to know that and if you're playing him you need to know that so that whenever possible you give him the, the push returns and cut down a little bit on the flicks that go into your strengths where possible. Um, so it's important to have a, a scout so you know what patterns are his favourites. Okay, now let's actually talk about a little bit about actually stopping these attacks. Okay, first option when stopping, trying to stop a third ball or fifth ball attack, okay, obviously use your strengths. So you should have a good idea about where you're strong versus where you're weak and that's your first go-to option. Um, especially if you haven't seen your opponent before and you don't really know what he's capable of, go with your strong game first. So if you've got a really nice heavy backspin push and a fairly good roll with the pips or with the ante, okay, start off with those. Give him the heavy spin and cut.